Welcome to the University of Illinois Extension's local government webinar. Today we will be discussing strategic priorities for local governments dealing with the current fiscal climate in Illinois. Our guest speakers are Scott Sorrell, County Administrator in Peoria County, and Deborah Busey, County Administrator in Champaign County. Scott Sorrell was named the Peoria County Administrator in May 2015. Prior to that, he spent more than 22 years with Peoria County. Sorrell started his career in the Planning and Zoning Department and has been in the County Administrator's Office since 2002. Deb Busey is the County Administrator of Champaign County and began working for Champaign County Government in August 1975. She has worked directly with the County Board, first as a County Co-Administrator, 1998 to 2009, charged with the Finance and HR Management, and then as County Administrator. We will be muting your phones during the presentation. However, please feel free to put questions in the chat box. We will try to answer your questions today. However, in keeping with our scheduled time, please put your email address along with your question in the chat box and include the name of the speaker you are addressing, and we will ask them to return their answers after the session closes if we do not or we're not able to cover all of the questions at the end of the session. Also, we will be putting a link to a survey in the chat box just before the end of the session. Actually, it is up there right now, and you will also receive an email regarding the survey just after the close of today's webinar. We would appreciate it if you would take a couple of minutes to complete the survey. Our committee is in the process of creating our next series of webinars, and your, in and your input on what topics you would like to hear about would be very useful to us in this process. Now, we will have Scott take over the presentation Scott? Thanks, Pamela, and uh, thanks everyone for being on today, uh, taking some time out of your uh, St. Patrick's Day to do so. If you hear any sirens in the background, I apologize. Um, the uh, the Peoria's uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, goes right by my office. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about today include um, some things that we're doing uh, from a collaboration uh, effort in terms of uh, our county board and our elected officials, um, the joint legislative process that we go through with the city of Peoria, uh, a Metro Peoria committee that we have with the city of Peoria to talk about uh, metropolitan and regional issues, uh, and then some internal things that we're doing uh, to uh, be strategic in how we deal with the current fiscal climate. Just very quickly, uh, some information about uh, Peoria County. Uh, we're a township form government, 18 members of single member districts, uh, including our chief judge and auditor. We've got 10 elected officials. Um, we've had the county administrator uh, form since the mid 80s. And just in terms of size, uh, we're 131 million uh, this year's budget, 877 employees, 630 square miles thereabouts. Uh, and a population of a little over 187,000. City of Peoria, it, which is why we partner with them quite a bit, is a major player uh, with uh, you know well over 60-70% uh, of our population. And also, we're not a PTEL county, so uh, we do not currently have tax caps, despite the pending le uh, legislation that's that's out there. Um, I'm not going to uh, go through any the details, but if you don't already use this, this is a little shameless plug for the National Association of Counties, uh, County Explorer. Um, you should, if you click on the link, or I should, I'm clicking on the link, and that, so that should bring it up. Um, I apologize, my uh, Wi-Fi connection looks to be a little slow today, so we'll uh, we'll work through that. Um, it is uh, that's a it's a a really good tool uh, to use to identify uh, uh, basic information uh, about uh, your county, uh, whether it be public health related, whether it be uh, any other type of generalized data that is collected uh, throughout the, the nation by any of the state or federal agencies. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to talk about today is coll our collaboration committee. Uh, and so uh, we created it uh, when uh, we had uh, the most recent county board elections, which is 
almost two years ago now, um, at least two years this fall, uh, the incoming county board chairman, uh, once he was elected, decided to create this committee. He did so because there was a tremendous amount of acrimony and uh, and just it's a very toxic environment in the organization as it relates to the board and the countywide elected officials. Uh, and that was really bore out through the budget process for fiscal year 2015 that was going on during 2014. We had a situation where the the especially in the general fund, uh, the gap between revenues and expenditures uh, was changing uh, regularly, almost daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, there was uh, poor communication uh, going on and uh, really a tremendous breakdown in terms of uh, the, the communication between the board and the elected officials. And one thing that is, I think, a little bit unique to Peoria County is that our group of elected officials uh, we have both uh, about half a Republican and a half a Democrat, but they really work together as a cohesive unit together. Uh, they've got an unwritten, unspoken policy that they don't campaign against uh, each other, uh, and they generally try to speak with one voice when uh, uh, dealing with the county board on a variety of issues. So, uh, so the, the county board chairman, as a way to try and mend those fences, created this committee. It includes all 10 of our elected officials, uh, and it includes the chairpersons of all of our standing committees on the county board, and we have six standing committees. Uh, some of the key functions that the committee undertakes includes uh, creating a general fund reporting tool, uh, which we'll see here in a couple of minutes, um, uh, building, rebuilding those relationships, uh, taking on a, a pretty large-scale project that we did last year, which is an organizational review and evaluation study. We'll talk a little bit about that here in a couple of minutes as well. And then our own internal legislative program, which has a tie uh, to another uh, portion of the presentation as it relates to the city of Peoria. So real quickly, I'm going to open up uh, the, uh, the collaboration committee packet from, uh, from January of this year. Uh, you should all be able to, to see it. Um, this is just straight uh, off of our website. And a couple of things that I really want to point out. Uh, Scott, Scott, if I could interrupt you, this is Tom Ward. Yep. Um, the way that Skype for Business is sharing things is initially it was selected to share PowerPoint slideshow. So when you click off of PowerPoint to go to a web browser, we're not seeing that. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Thanks for sharing that, Tom. I appreciate okay. it. So we've got two choices. Either we can change what you're sharing, or you can simply talk us through it, and we can continue to watch the slides. I think that'll be best. And I think if there's a way to share with the participants after uh, after the webinar, uh, the the slide deck, or at least the links in the slide deck, uh, so that they've got that information if they want it, uh, that would be uh, probably best. Right, and and in fact, uh, one of the participants shared just shared in a chat that in fact they can click on the link inside the PowerPoint and go to that in a separate window, awesome. uh, if they choose to do so. So, All right. so hopefully, uh, those of you thanks uh, whoever posted that in the chat on uh, the chat board, uh, if you've done that, uh, 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 please go to it now. If not, uh, just kind of follow along. So the first thing I'd like to talk about in uh, in that. Um, in that attached document is our uh, financial report, which is starts on page six uh, of that PDF, and that's a document uh, that uh, we created uh, jointly with uh, the uh, the collaboration committee and the elected officials and our finance department. Uh, it really it has allowed us to stabilize and address that entire situation we had where the numbers were changing constantly. It just is a different way of, of presenting data that we were already presenting. Uh, we, we have a snapshot at a high level of where the revenues and expenses are versus original budget and adjusted budget and typically year to date. Um, one of the key factors is we broke it out by, uh, by office. Uh, so all the administrative departments or the departments that report to the county administrator are bundled together, but then each uh, elected official has their own page uh, to show where they track in relationship to um, their uh, their appropriation for revenues and expenditures. Uh, a good 
very quick example of that uh, would be uh, the the circuit court clerk, which is on uh, thir page 13 of that PDF. Uh, you'll see uh, that uh, on on this example, um, uh, you know the revenues are coming in under budget, but so are uh, the expenditures as well. And a key component of this that was very important in terms of rebuilding those relationships was uh, the opportunity for each elected official to provide written remarks. Uh, this month, or in this report, uh, in this example, the circuit court clerk did not provide any any comments, and that's largely because there really has, there's, hasn't been a material change uh, in terms of where their numbers are shaking out uh, for a couple of months. Uh, the committee had previously discussed what uh, what the issues were in terms of uh, slowing down uh, fee revenue and and uh, him holding positions open, uh, vacant positions open in the office to try and save money on the expenditure side. The second component uh, as it relates to the collaboration committee is the efficiency study. And for those of you that do have the PDF open or are able to open it, uh, that starts on page uh, 40 of that uh, linked PDF. Uh, so as I quickly go to page 40 myself, um, we retained uh, Matrix Consulting Group uh, to do uh, what we refer to as an efficiency study. Uh, its technical name was Organizational Review and Evaluation Study. Uh, I think some some county board members uh, were uh, definitely going into the process thinking that uh, this would be our smoking gun to be able to downsize the organization uh, in a variety of areas. Um, uh, the elected officials, I think, went into it uh, thinking that this would be justification that we are either staffed correctly or uh, even in some cases understaffed. And what we were able to do is really look at, at a high level, uh, all of the uh, major services that we deliver as a county government and look at how well um, we deliver those services, how efficiently we deliver those services. And what we came back with was uh, a series of uh, about 62 or 63 recommendations uh, that are filtered throughout that entire report with uh, some detail in terms of how we might um, how we might improve our efficiency. It was it, it did not come back uh, with that smoking gun. Uh, it came back and basically said, you know, for the level of service that we deliver, we deliver pretty well, uh, and and are we're relatively staffed correctly. There are some areas where we need to do some more investigation, uh, and they called those out, and we're in the process of of doing that now. Um, the key thing for us in terms of implementation going forward is we've created an implementation team internally uh, and their sole focus it has representation from the board from elected officials in fact it's led by our recorder uh, and uh, and then myself and uh, staff from the administrative offices uh, its sole focus is to make sure that we maintain uh, the levels that we're at uh, and that where there are opportunities for efficiency and process improvement, we start working on that. And we've already started uh, down that path. We're uh, working uh, in the auditor's office. We're working in our planning and zoning department uh, just uh, to get out of the gate. Uh, and then uh, there's some areas where we've already achieved some of the recommendations. The third bullet point that is related to this report is just an example of of that building uh, the the relationship back, and that is as it relates to Headington Oaks Software. And Headington Oaks is our skilled nursing facility uh, or nursing home. Uh, it's uh, a new facility. Uh, there's a, uh, quite frankly a majority of our elected officials that. Um, that don't believe we should be in the nursing home business. Uh, there's a, uh, a small minority of board members that believe the same, but a majority of the board right now believes we should be uh, in that business. Uh, with many county-owned nursing homes, uh, for those of you that have them, uh, you'll know that it continues to be a financial struggle. Uh, and one of the things that, we're, that we did uh, last fall was to uh, replace a piece of software uh, that would get us to a point where we can increase our Medicare uh, reimbursement rate, uh, which has a significant impact on the financial bottom line of it of the nursing homes operations. Um, the elected officials chose to use the cal the collaboration committee as a vehicle to voice their concerns, uh, and uh, and even though the the county board had already awarded a contract. Uh, they felt the need to have that discussion, so we put some information together uh, for the committee 
so that they could go back and and have that discussion. Uh, it really was the opportunity to voice some concerns uh, by the elected officials. No real other action was taken out, of it, taken out of it, and that's primarily because the collaboration committee in our rules of order does not have uh, any ability to really move a resolution forward to the county board. It really is almost an advisory committee, even though it is a full standing committee of the board. So the, one of the things that we do talk about in collaboration committee and they have direct oversight of is our uh, legislative priorities. And that's one thing that we work together with the city of Peoria on, and we're going to talk a little bit later about. But right now, uh, I'd like to talk about Metro Peoria committee. Metro Peoria committee is a cooperative effort between ourselves and the city of Peoria. Um, it's uh, beyond the informal day-to-day -day cooperation that happens at all levels of both organizations, whether it be a sheriff's deputy and a city police officer working together, whether it be a, uh, a planner in both of the planning and zoning departments working together, or whether it be the city manager and myself working together, um, or, or the, the, the elected city treasurer and the elected county treasurer are working together. Uh, there's uh, lots of cooperation going on, information sharing going on uh, every day just during the normal course of business. Um, the Metro Peoria Committee, though, did create a formal venue for the policymakers to exchange ideas. Uh, and our, currently, the membership has three city council members, three county board members, and then we're currently amending the, the committee's rules uh, and charter so that we can add one citizen from each, uh, each one of the two bodies. And then the chairperson rotates. So, for example, right now, the chairperson is one of the three city council members. The, the committee has uh, four primary goals. Uh, the first is, uh, a key, is the key to being effective in service delivery. Uh, two, uh, we both uh, take very seriously uh, our her we, what the county calls heritage neighborhoods. Uh, we need to revitalize those neighborhoods. Uh, and, and therefore, the committee is also an instrument to, be a, to create a vibrant economy locally um, while the rest of the nation continues to survive and, and, and improve economically. Uh, we all know that Illinois, uh, largely because of the budget impasse and the politics in Springfield, uh, is, is uh, lagging the rest of the country. And in Peoria, uh, we're lagging the rest of the state. Uh, it's been widely reported that uh, Caterpillar is going through a significant uh, restructuring. There's still a major economic engine in the Peoria region. Uh, and they're reducing their headcount uh, by almost 10, 11 percent uh, globally. Uh, and uh, a lot of that was done through early retirement incentives, and many of those were done here in the Peoria area. And so uh, while they're not, those folks are not technically unemployed, uh, we're seeing decreases, uh, or at best, flat uh, sales tax growth and really no tax base growth growth from a, from a property development standpoint. Uh, so this is one of the key areas that, that the committee focuses on uh, because if we can improve the region, uh, then we can uh, improve the economy and the two of us need to work together to be able to do that. So uh, one of the things that they did uh, with this is we uh, we created a, a web page for the, for the committee uh, and it uh, has all the minutes uh, and a whole bunch of other information. One of the key things that we've done uh, is create a Live Shop Peoria um, uh, presence and a campaign. Uh, the two governments working together. We're Peoria is a, a, a three-county metropolitan uh, or region, uh, and uh, we've seen quite a bit of leakage uh, to uh, to our good friends across the river in Tazewell County. Uh, we want to try and recapture that as much as we can because that helps our sales tax bottom line. We've also seen, also seen quite a bit of leakage to online inter internet sales. Uh, and so part of the campaign is focused on shopping in Peoria County and part of the campaign is making sure that uh, you're at least shopping in a bricks and mortar store uh, so that uh, those sales taxes are realized at the local level. Uh, Upon the creation of the committee, one of the things that uh, we've done or that they did was create a, a citizen group called Pass Forward, uh, which uh, looked at uh, ways and um, potential uh, ways to consolidate either services or either government. This was uh, almost five years ago, so it was long before the, the current effort uh, by the governor and the lieutenant governor to look at government consolidation. Um, we brought in uh, uh, 
Northern Illinois University uh, to to help uh, do a study, uh, the citizen group came back with some initial uh, recommendations, one of which to date has been implemented, and that is we went to the voters and uh, uh, abolished the city election commission and moved elections out of the county clerk, and we now have a county election commission that discusses or that manages elections for the entire county uh, and uh, uh, yes, uh, Tuesday's primary was the first major election countywide that uh, the new election, com newly created election commission managed, and all in all uh, went pretty well. Some of the other things that we look at, we do uh, joint purchasing. Uh, for example, we purchase uh, uh, gasoline and diesel fuel uh, for our fleet together uh, and a bunch of other things. Uh, we barter public services, our public safety services, for example. Uh, we uh, barter the cost of dispatching their 911 center dispatches for us uh, and in exchange for that we don't charge them uh, to hold uh, their arrestees pre-arraignment because they do not have a lockup facility so when someone in the city of Peoria gets arrested uh, they uh, you get booked into the county jail uh, we hold you until you're arraigned uh, and uh, we do not charge the city of Peoria for that service because it's roughly the same as what the dispatch services are uh, we're, uh, we're much better prepared than they are to do uh, bridge inspections, so uh, we handle bridge inspections for them. And then we also share IT infrastructure uh, so that we've got some redundant systems. They, uh, they've mapped uh, most of their uh, infrastructure uh, to servers that we have, and we've done the same so that we've got uh, some business continuity. Uh, and then we also have a dedicated fiber line that we jointly own between our two data centers so that we can, uh, the information that we do share on a daily basis comes through the pipeline faster. One of the, like, as I was saying, one of the, the key functions of, of what, uh, what the committee does is our joint legislative agenda. Uh, we do that so that we have one local voice for the region, or, or at least the county, and between the two local units of government. Uh, and then it maximizes the legislators' time because we, um, we uh, invite all of them uh, together at a, at a breakfast and we roll through what our uh, proposals are for the year. Um, so at that breakfast, we've got uh, par participation from the entire board and city council. And then obviously we're inviting our, our local representatives and state senators. Uh, we break that presentation up into uh, uh, three areas, direct sponsorship requests, position support requests, and capital requests. Uh, this slide here just shows you a breakdown of what this year's requests are that we made. Uh, and you'll see that we either do that jointly or one of the governments takes the lead on it. Uh, for example, declaring uh, vacant land abandoned as a direct sponsorship request, that's a joint uh, request of us. Uh, the city is very interesting and interested in and needing uh, the extension of the state historic tax credits. Um, and we're uh, very interested in, as an example, the retailer's occupation uh, tax access, which municipal governments already have, but county governments do not. Um, then we talk a little bit about position support requests, and this is, you know, uh, where we local governments typically play defense uh, in the in the legislature session. We want to make sure that they we don't uh, we actively are uh, protecting uh, our uh, rights to govern at the local level and making sure that they aren't taking away any of our funding sources. Uh, one thing that's important to us is probation officer salaries, uh, and we want to continue to make sure that those are fully funded or funded at the highest levels. And then, yes, there is no capital bill, but we talk about uh, some very high level, uh, very important uh, capital needs that, uh, that we have, uh, and so those go through the process each year as well. Some internal operations that, uh, that Peoria County all by itself does in terms of uh, trying to uh, be uh, strategic in dealing with the fiscal climate. Uh, we have a centralized IT uh, shop here. So elected each individual elected official does not have their own IT staff. Uh, everything comes back to a centralized IT service. We've had that for more than 30 years. Uh, and it's a model that works pretty well for us. Uh, it's largely funded through uh, the automation funds that offices collect and internal chargebacks. Uh, they, uh, they lead from a technology standpoint all the software acquisitions uh, and they pay the, the annual maintenance fees on all of the third-party software platforms that we use. Um, 
Uh, and then, uh, as, so as it says, they manage, but they don't own the projects. Uh, a department or a business unit needs to own uh, each one of the projects. Uh, we also are looking at facilities master planning. We just finished that, uh, and that, that master planning effort identified uh, for us a new capital budgeting process, but it also led to uh, an Americans with Disabilities Act uh, compliance assessment. We don't have one of those a compliance plan in place, and so we're going through an assessment process right now, and then we'll be drafting our plan. Uh, and then we uh, are actively engaged in cooperative purchasing programs, whether that be U.S. communities through the National Association of Counties, state bids, or, uh, or the GSA, or other uh, types of uh, joint purchasing programs. We take advantage of as many of those as possible. We write our bid specs so that when we put a bid on the street, uh, uh, other units of government can uh, buy off of our bid uh, should they choose to going forward. And so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Deb. Okay, great. Um, thank you. What we're going to look at in this next section is op opportunities for gen generating savings and at the same time improving results and outcomes through what we do. So joint venture is the first um, opportunity that I want to talk about. Under GASB, a joint venture is defined as a legal entity or other organization that results from a contractual arrangement and that is owned and operated and governed by two or more participants as a separate and specific activity which is subject to the joint control in which the participants must either retain an ongoing financial interest or an ongoing financial responsibility. This is made possible to us through the statutes through the Intergovernmental Cooperation Act which enables local government par partners to enter into agreements among themselves and provide authority for intergovernmental cooperation. Champaign County is a party to two joint ventures, our METCAD 911 services, which we have been members of since 1983, and the GIS consortium, which was established in 2002. This joint venture concept provides the ability to consolidate, save resources, and ensure stronger quality outcomes through cooperation. So looking at METCAD 911. This is a consolidated dispatch center which was established in June of 1979 with at the time nine telecommunicators and an administrative staff of two. When it was established, METCAD served the police departments in Champaign, Urbana, and the University of Illinois. In 1983, the Champaign County Sheriff's Office joined, and in 1988, METCAD merged with FIRECOM to consolidate fire and police dispatching services. Today, METCAD answers emergency 911 calls for all of Champaign County. Most recently, the village of Rantoul, which had maintained its own um, operations center, joined METCAD in 2015. So with a staff of 30 telecommunicators, two supervisors, three technical positions, and three administrative staff members, METCAD provides direct dispatch ser service for all of the law enforcement and fire agencies throughout the entire county. METCAD is funded by contributions from the member public safety agencies as well as the $1.50 cent per month surcharge on landlines, which we all know is a diminishing source of revenue, and a portion of the $0.87 cent each wireless telephone user pays for their wireless devices. These surcharges help pay for the 911 services in addition to the contributions by the member agencies. So this is a look at what METCAD looks like. As a joint venture, it's a standalone operation, but it is through the intergovernmental agreements with all of these agencies established as under the umbrella of the city of Champaign, which serves as the lead agency for METCAD. So as the lead agency, Champaign, the city of Champaign's financial systems, personnel management systems, um, using the city of Champaign's FEIN number, the, this joint venture METCAD operates under the city of Champaign. The joint venture, however, has to be audited separately, which is a requirement. And then the actual governance for what happens with the operation of METCAD is subject to approval of this METCAD governing board. So you see there, there are six members represented. Each member has um, two representatives that serve on the METCAD policy board, which is the governing board for METCAD. The cities of Champaign, Urbana, um, University of Illinois, and the village of Rantoul each have 
one administrative representative on the governing board and then they rotate between their fire chiefs and police chiefs sitting on the governing board. Those rotate on an annual basis so that there are always two fire chiefs and two police chiefs from those four representative agencies. Champaign County has an administrative representative and the sheriff because the county does not do fire. And then all of the rural fire departments and rural police departments um, elect or select a representative who will represent them on the, on the policy board and those two individuals also sit there. Um, in terms of governance, it's all defined by, an, by the intergovernmental agreements which all of these agencies sign off on and bylaws that are established. The budget for METCAD is approved by the policy board and it must be approved by a majority of the board members which as you can see here there are 12 board members but in addition it, the requirement is that four of the five administrators must agree or approve the budget. This is to ensure that the member agencies individual financial situations are taken well into consideration as a METCAD budget is approved which might not necessarily, which is considered a responsibility or something that the administrative officials would have a significant interest in um, and that sometimes the public safety representatives might not have as much knowledge about. That has worked well in terms of defining the budget for METCAD. The outcomes of this joint venture, obviously we have fewer staff than if each entity operated its own 911 center which generates lower costs for all participants. The required technology infrastructure is much more robust and provides development opportunities because it is a structure that is large enough to serve all of the entities and agencies within the county. One example of this is that Champaign County METCAD is one of the first agencies in the state to introduce text to 911 as an option. Additional positive outcomes is that the function of METCAD governance has resulted in increased coordination and co cooperation of services delivered by all the p police agencies in the county because of the partnership that starts at METCAD. So these police chiefs are all sitting together or are represented at the METCAD governance body and out of that over the last um, 10 to 15 years there's been developed a system where the chiefs of police regularly meet by on their own and develop strategic plans and development for improved countywide delivery of public safety services. Um, examples are one agency has CIT training but offer it to all the other agencies to ensure that as many officers as possible in Champaign County have been exposed to and have this training. There are also specialties in each of the departments that are made available and shared re regardless of the jurisdictional boundaries. This is also enhanced by the fact that the dispatch center knows where these specialties are and based on the incident knows how to dispatch the appropriate, you know, perhaps sheriff's canine drug unit to an event in Champaign even though, you know, it, it's a sheriff's office unit. Another benefit is that all the police agencies in Champaign County use a records management system that was actually developed by the city of Urbana's IT department and is shared through cost sharing agreements. So having all of those agencies using consistent reporting and uh, records management systems is a benefit to the jail and the rest of the criminal justice system. The other thing is because it's been developed in-house, um, when the police agencies have upgrades or changes that they would like made to that system, it can be done and the cost sharing is easier than it would be if we were dealing with software vendors, at least based on our experiences. So there is a great um, benefit to all of the users in the system through, and this is just something that has developed because of the coordinated efforts of public safety in Champaign County. The second joint venture in Champaign County is the GIS Consortium. This consortium was formed in September of 2002 in order to secure the benefits of data collection and analysis at a countywide scale to be shared and to share the cost of implementation, maintenance, and data acquisition for the countywide GIS maps. Champaign County is the lead agency for this joint venture. Currently there are seven members. The county provides 58 percent of the funding for this consortium through the countywide GIS recording fee and the other member agencies are billed for the balance of the operational cost based on a per capita formula. 
This is a look at the governance model for the GIS consortium. This um, model has seven member agencies instead of the six that are in METCAD. Five of the agencies are the same as on, on the METCAD joint venture, which has also proved beneficial because sharing between the two joint ventures is viewed as equitable because most of the member agencies are paying for both of these operations. There is only one um, representative from each member agency on the policy council or, or governing board for GIS consortium. And again, they are responsible for planning and budgeting the oversight of these services. There are three other entities within Champaign County who also participate in the GIS consortium, not as member agencies, but as principal data clients, which means they contract with the GIS consortium to develop and manage all of their mapping requirements. And these are the Champaign-Urbana Mass Transit District, Champaign-Urbana Public Health, and the Urbana-Champaign Sanitary District. It's very beneficial that all of these layers are developed by the same um, staff uh, to build the map that is countywide for Champaign County. The consortium also provides GIS services to Piatt County through an intergovernmental contractual agreement. Um, this has been developed in the last few years and Piatt County is saving significant dollars by contracting with the Champaign County GIS consortium as opposed to their previous relationship with a private vendor who was providing these services to them. This is just a look at the mission of the GIS consortium that shows you that the responsibility of the consortium is agreed to be responsible for data, to establish the standards for how that data is developed and structured, to provide um, server accessibility to all members and host all of the data, make it available to the members, basically to establish operational, administrative, and procedural policy as recommended for the GIS system operations. These are some of the outcomes that we have seen as a result of the GIS joint venture. We have a staff of six employees who provide mapping service to seven joint venture member governmental entities, as well as to the additional contracting agencies, which is a most cost-efficient approach. Obviously, if each of these entities attempted to do this on their own, it would take far more employees to accomplish that. Orthophotography, which wasn't always consistently done before 2005, is now part of the mission of the GIS consortium and is mandated to be done and flown every three years. Again, the economy of flying all of the jurisdictional areas in the county at one time ensures a lower cost for all of the members to get that product and ability to obtain higher quality in the, in the final product for all entities. In addition to this, the last two times the county has done the orthophotography, we have also flown Piatt County at the same time as part of our arrangement with them, which again just extends the benefits and savings in having this done. The base map development and regional layers are built consistently based on the GIS consortium direction and standards, which is a benefit. And countywide addressing is managed by the consortium, which results in the cities not being required to map boundaries, subdivisions, parcels, street center lines, and entities like MedCAD 911 do not have to maintain separate addressing systems. All of that is done, and there is consistency and quality of data through this approach. So everyone is using basically the same addressing system, and this has certainly been a benefit to METCAD, who attempted to maintain their own addressing system prior to 2013, which frequently was flawed and resulted in emergency um, responders going to the wrong location. The GIS consortium also includes a technology committee, which enables which is made up of a representative a technology expert from each of the member agencies who regularly meet, share their expertise, and provide technology recommendations, which do establish the pro protocols that are, that are applied system-wide. And the benefit here, again, is that it's just not one or two technology experts who are driving the decisions about how METCAD will, or how the GIS consortium will move forward, but there has to be a consensus and a, and a development of agreement in those recommendations which ultimately come to the policy board. 
There are other intergovernmental cooperation opportunities obviously available outside of joint ventures through the Intergovernmental Cooperation Act. And these are just a few of the examples from Champaign County. The village of Savoy, although it is growing rapidly and currently has a population of almost 8,000, um, contracts with the Champaign County Sheriff for all of its law enforcement services. And this is certainly a benefit to them and a savings to not have to establish their own police department because they could not operate with just one or two um, law enforcement officers as many of smaller villages do. Champaign County Animal Control contracts with the city of Champaign, which is the largest municipality in the county at the population of a little over 83,000 and 16 of the 22 villages in the county to provide animal control services. Animal control also contracts with the cities of Champaign and Urbana and 20 of the 22 villages to provide animal impound services. In all of these cases, the cost of operation to the contracting municipalities is less than if they independently provided these services and all the required infrastructure that goes with it. So the scope, quality, and delivery of the services is better as a result of the consolidation. Another area where we have um, looked to attempt to uh, create greater efficiencies and, and generate savings is in our labor agreements. So a labor cost challenge to Champaign County has always been health insurance. Champaign County has 13 bargaining units, eight AFSCME, and five FOP. And prior to 2011, every one of those 13 bargaining contracts specifically defined the exact terms of the health insurance benefits to be provided each year. In addition, these contracts are on staggered terms, so which magnified the difficulty to change the benefits terms because while we might be able to negotiate changes in two or three of the contracts, the other 10 would still have the terms that were defined in the contracts previously negotiated. To add to this complication with health insurance, Champaign County is also in a region where there is a monopoly on health insurance. There's really only one real provider because of the relationship between CARL, the major regional health care provider, and Health Alliance Medical Plans, which is the insurance provider linked to CARL. The, um, we, we, are, we are really tied to Health Alliance as our health insurance provider because the CARL doctors give much better discounts to Health Alliance than they do to Blue Cross or Aetna or any other um, insurance companies. And all of the doctors in, in our region are basically tied to CARL. So we are very much tied to having to negotiate with Health Alliance. In addition to these complications, um, the healthcare provider also knew exactly what the county would be required to purchase in the ensuing year for its health insurance because the labor contracts are public documents posted on our website, thus making negotiation of the terms with the provider more difficult because they knew exactly what, what it was that we have to purchase. So to work towards improving this situation, we established in 2011 a labor management health insurance committee. The county negotiated with all 13 of the bargaining units to establish this committee and the primary goal of this committee was to assume the responsibility to annually review, assess, and recommend health insurance plans that would be implemented in the ensuing fiscal year. The makeup of the committee is two county board members and one alternate, four AFSCME members and one alternate, four FOP members and one alternate, and six management non-bargaining employees, which include the county administrator, deputy county administrator, health insurance specialist, and three non-bargaining members appointed by the county administrator and one alternate. So the committee is comprised of 16 members with four alternates who can sit in at any time if there's an absence of any one of the regular committee members. The voting requirements are that 75% of the members of the committee must agree on the annual insurance plan recommendation, which means there has to be agreement between both labor and management about the terms of the health insurance plan to be recommended and pursued. In the first year of this health and labor managed health insurance committee, I'm just going to give you an example of what was accomplished. The committee selected a plan with higher deductible and some new co-pays 
To save on the cost of premium, the annual premium savings were $600 per employee by going to that new plan. If we had not had the Labor Management Health Insurance Committee, our contracts would not have allowed us to go to a higher deductible or changes in copays. The county assumed the additional annual $750 liability to the employees of the new plan by reimbursing the employees for those expenses through a health reimbursement account, HRA. Because of actual utilization, the HRA liability could be budgeted at 20% of the actual total liability by the county. So for 643 employees, under the old plan, the premium increase would have been $385,800. Under the new plan, and adding in the HR funding requirement, the increase was $96,450, which generated a total plan design savings of almost $290,000. The outcomes of the Labor Management Health Insurance Committee? Collective bargaining agreements no longer contain language defining specific benefits of health insurance plans to be provided, which in addition to the benefit that I just discussed, also very much streamlines the negotiation process of those 13 different bargaining agreements. Over the last five years, uh, the committee has continued developing strategies as provided in the example of working with premium cost savings through HRA reimbursements, um, adopting changes to the plans, copay or benefit structures, and in fact, also have agreed to um, changing the plans so that a, a greater burden of the cost of the plans is borne by the employees. And this is made possible because we now have eight of our um, employees who are leaders among their labor groups who participate in the process of purchasing health insurance for the next year, which has enabled them to become owners of the health insurance plans and owners in the process. And when they see the full scope of everything that goes into health insurance and where the costs are and why they go up, they have been more amenable to agreeing that there does have to be greater cost sharing with the employees, which has been an excellent outcome of this whole effort. The uh, the county's overall health insurance premium increases have been held at 5% or less per year for the, for the past five-year period, which um, in our experience is probably much better than we would have been able to do without this health insurance committee. And finally, the health insurance providers don't any longer have access to what we are required to purchase before negotiating with them, which gives them a little bit better position for negotiating the terms of health insurance with the actual health insurance providers. My final um, area that I wanted to talk about with regard to how savings can be generated is in the area of technology. Champaign County has an integrated justice technology system which was fully implemented in 2007. The um, integrated justice information system has an advisory committee which provides oversight in systems development, changes, upgrades, etc. Those members include the primary key players who are the circuit clerk, the court administrator representing the judges, the state's attorney, the sheriff, the public defender, the director of probation, the county administrator, the county IT director, and the court's technology specialist. With this system, from intake at the jail to final disposition of the case, information flows from one step in the system to the next, which eliminates the need for redundant entry of data at each of the six points in the criminal justice system. Outcomes of this system have been that through approval by the state for electronic automated disposition reporting, case information, including disposition, is shared electronically with the Secretary of State, State Police, and AOIC, which results in more accurate and timely reporting. Previously, this was all done on paper, often took a very long time to get completed, submitted, and updated to their systems. The police agency reports are submitted electronically to the state's attorney, which eliminates the need under the old system where um, the police agencies had to prepare their reports and transport copies of the reports to the state's attorney's office. Additionally, when the state's attorney's office is receiving these reports electronically, they're also receiving information from the jail about the individuals who have been arrested in the last 24 hours, and that information is automatically updated into the state's attorney's system and then into the circuit clerks and so on. 
Docket sheets and all court documents are available to everyone in the system simultaneously, so there is no need to scan documents anymore or transport paper files. The efficiencies that have been gained through this integrated justice technology system since its inception in 2007 has enabled the elimination of 11.5 full-time equivalent clerical positions throughout the justice system throughout the justice system offices simply because the implementation of this technology. The technology also places the, the integration of the technology also places the county in a better position with its infrastructure for moving forward with new projects such as e-ticketing, e-citations, evidence sharing, of body cam videos, and issues similar to that. So in closing, I just would like to say that, you know, this is a challenging fiscal climate, but it presents us with opportunities to develop more streamlined, effective, and efficient structures for the delivery of services to the taxpayers as we identify and implement recommendations for consolidation and sharing between governmental units. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deb. I appreciate that. We have a few questions out there. I just want to let everyone know that an email went out to you just a few minutes ago about the survey that we would like you to take. It does not include the link to this presentation, but I promise you as soon as I can after the presentation is over with, I will get that link out on box and I will email it to all the, the registrants. So we will get that out to you. Uh, let's get back to these questions. Um, the first question we have is actually back to um, um, Scott's presentation. Scott, are you out there? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. I can. So uh, you, you see the question out there for you? I do. Uh, so uh, uh, how do we manage the policy side in a centralized way? And probably the best a couple of ways to answer that question is uh, 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 maybe not the best uh, way that you'd want to hear this is you know, we've had it centralized for you know more than three decades in our corporate culture, uh, and so we don't we've never had to go through the challenge of having to move from decentralized to uh, we've lost you, Scott. Deb, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, Scott. He may have gotten off for just a second. We'll see if he comes right back in. Otherwise, we'll switch over to you, Deb, and then uh, have him complete his when he comes back on. Okay. Um, Deb, we've got a few questions over here for you from Union County. Um, let's start with this, and we'll pull Scott back in as soon as we get a second. Okay. Uh, Deb, your first question is, and, and all of these are from Union County. So uh, uh, first of all, day to day, who is in charge of METCAD within the dispatch center? There is an executive director who is um, hired and who reports directly to the city manager of the city of Champaign because that is the um, lead agency. But the executive director is hired with input from the um, policy board and also provides um, input to the city manager in the annual performance appraisal of that position. Okay. Um, and Union County, let us know if we're not getting your questions answered. Uh, the second one, uh, Deb, do you get 100% cost recovery for the law enforcement services in Savoy? We, we get 100% cost recovery in terms of the sheriff's operations. So we total all of the salaries, costs per vehicle, all of the sheriff's overhead is covered in the cost recovery. However, Champaign County doesn't have an indirect rate overall for all of its services, so there's probably a small percentage that we are not achieving because we don't have those charges included. But anything related to the sheriffs, to personnel staffing costs, fringe benefits costs, all of that is included in the cost recovery. Okay. Um, I, the last question for you, uh, Deb, is, uh, or I believe so, what has been the timeline or process in development of intergovernmental agreements for planning and services both? Well, certainly for the METCAD Policy Board, well, for both of the joint ventures, 
Um, the timeline for um, from start to finish of achieving the development of the agreement and then getting all of the member agencies to sign off on it is at a minimum six to nine months and probably more typically about a year. But you have to understand that included in our um, joint venture for, for both of those is the University of Illinois. And their processes and timelines cause an extended delay in getting those intergovernmental agreements done because their, their process is just a bit more cumbersome than that of the local agency. So without the University of Illinois, I would say we, we would probably take probably six to nine months typically from start to finish to get an intergovernmental agreement um, up and running. Now when we have to do changes to the existing agreement, it probably takes only about three months. Okay. Um, next question, and I, I hope I'm reading this correctly. Does your IJIS system, I think that's it, or maybe. That's the Integrated Justice Information okay. Service. Yeah. Does that system involve multiple solutions across the offices or a single vendor joint system? We have, we all, our integrated system is all provided through Jano, which is the software vendor who provides that. We have been able to do a lot of development with them because we are their first county that is fully integrated. And our courts technology specialist is also able to do enhancements to that system. So when there are changes, there are changes that are specific to the state's attorney module, for example, or specific to the circuit clerk's module, but then the integration of the information being shared still carries forward after those changes are upgraded. Thank you. Uh, the last question for you, Deb, is, and by the way, they're saying fantastic presentations by both speakers. Thank you so much. I'd like to put that comment out there. Um, the last question, does your METCAD governing board exist separately from an ETSB or does it encompass that within it? They're separate. Okay. Well, that's it. I'm sorry. It appears we've lost Scott. However, the Union County who asked him a question did leave their email address. So I want to let you know, Union County, that we will give that question an email address to Scott and I'm sure he will be responding to you. Uh, again, um, we appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, you will be receiving that survey. Please help us out. I believe in the survey is also my email address. I'm Pam Shellhorn with the University of Illinois Extension. Feel free if you have any additional questions, comments, you just uh, email me and I'd be happy to help you or get you to one of the speakers so that you could get your questions answered. Thanks again and everyone have a wonderful day.